course he's here, Miss Bates. Oh, oh dear, oh goodness me. Jane, dear, would you? Oh, please, I just cannot. Oh, no, no, dear, of course not. I shall just say you were upstairs upon the bed, and I'm sure you look bad enough to be so. Uh, tell her I'll be with her in a moment. Yes, miss. Miss Bates begs to be excused, miss. She won't be a moment. Thank you, Patty. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, how exceedingly kind. I, um, I had thought for a moment it might be Mr. Frank Churchill. He, he promised to call to mend my mother's spectacles again, but he has not been. I, I expect you've come to congratulate Jane on her post with Mrs. Elton's friend in Bristol. She will be very gratified, I'm sure. Miss Bates, that is not So really very good. kind of you. She will be pleased. Dear Jane, it will be very trying to part with her after so long. Poor child, she's, she's retired to bed with a most excruciating headache. And I've positively forbidden her to see anyone. I'm Jane, dear, I said just lie there, dear, until you feel better. I'm very sorry to hear this, Miss Bates, but to be honest, my reason for coming concerns yourself. She would sit up to all hours last night, Miss Woodhouse, writing letters. I said to her, Jane, dear, I said you were surely blind yourself. That is exactly what I said, Miss Woodhouse, and so it has proved. Miss Bates... I have it greatly upon my conscience that something I may have said yesterday upon Box Hill may have caused you pain. What? Who, me, dear? I could not sleep last night for thinking of it. Please forgive me. Oh, I do not recall anything. Nothing at all. And even if you did, I'm sure it was not intentional. I always so generous, so kind, both you and dear Mr. Woodhouse. <laughs> Goodness me, what can have happened to Mr. Frank Churchill? Poor mother cannot see a thing without her spectacles, and it's so unlike him not to come when he has promised. Yesterday forenoon, the weather appeared so bright that I foolishly extended my usual walk as far as the fifth beech tree. Really? So today I'm paying a little for my rashness. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. If you'll excuse me, I'm... Emma, my dear, such melancholy news. Mr. Knightley is leaving us. Leaving us? I am to see my brother John and Isabella in London, that is all. Have you any message beyond the usual love which nobody remembers to carry? No, nothing particular. This scheme is rather sudden, is it not? I have had it in my mind for some time. Oh, before I go, I do have one piece of truly melancholy news. Mrs. Churchill has been taken gravely ill and is not expected to live beyond the month. Oh, dear. Oh, Mrs. Churchill. Ah, oh, well, you do not surprise me. You do not surprise me at all. Frank Churchill had a message waiting for him last night on his return from Box Hill. Oh, one must expect such news when one reaches my age. Hey, Emma, my dear, I hope you found my dear old friend Miss Bates in good health and not too fatigued after her outing yesterday. You have been visiting Miss Bates? Yes. There was something on my mind I particularly wished to say to her. Good. You did well. Thank you. Well, goodbye, Mr. Woodhouse. Take good care of yourself. Goodbye, dear friend. Please do not leave us for long. Goodbye. So now it is for Mrs. Churchill. Grievous news, grievous news indeed. Took cold, no doubt, moving from one room to another. Poor Mrs. Churchill. To be honest, I had not thought her so gravely ill. Oh, no, Miss Woodhouse. It is very sad indeed it is. Her passing will come as something of a shock to us all. Oh, yes, Miss Woodhouse. I fancy it will alter Mr. Frank Churchill's circumstances considerably. Oh, yes, I suppose so, Miss Woodhouse. It is doubly unfortunate it should come at this moment with Mrs. Weston so near her time and in such delicate health. Yes, Miss Woodhouse. Miss Woodhouse, Mr. Weston is here and wishes to see you most urgently. Mr. Weston? Oh, Mr. Weston, is anything wrong? Oh, it is all right, my dear. It is nothing to do with what you're thinking. But Mrs. Weston would like you to come all the same, if you will. But yes, of course I will, but can you not tell me? I'd rather not, my dear, if you don't mind. Oh. oh, very well. One moment while I get my shawl. Miss 
Mrs. Weston, what is it? Please sit down, my dear. Thank you, my love. Emma, we have this morning received a wholly unexpected visit from my husband's son, Frank. I hope you conveyed my very real sorrow at Mrs. Churchill's death. Yes, of course, but you realise, do you not, my dear, that this will greatly alter his circumstances? You mean he will inherit? Well, yes, but... Emma, he came this morning expressly to speak to his father on another matter concerning his future. Oh? Oh, Emma, dear, I hardly know how to tell you this, but he... he has an attachment. Indeed? In fact, it would be truer to say that he is engaged to be married. Mr. Churchill? To whom, pray? To Jane Fairfax. Jane Fairfax? In fact, they were already engaged before he first came here. Good God, you are not serious. Ever since their meeting at Weymouth. Oh, please believe that neither his father nor I had the slightest suspicion of this ourselves until this morning. Then how could he allow Jane to, to take a post as a governess? Oh, Emma, he knew nothing of this. On that score, at least, I can acquit him. No doubt his persistent attendance of late on Mrs. Churchill had led Jane to... to question the wisdom of placing too much reliance on his loyalty. Hence the decision to take the post in Bristol. Poor girl. I fear she must have suffered very much to have taken such a step. So, he was engaged all the time. Well, this is a circumstance it will take me at least half a day to think about before I can begin to digest it. I do not wonder at your astonishment or your anger. There is one aspect of his behaviour which neither his father nor I can ever forgive. I think you must know what I mean. Oh, my anger, if I have any, is not for myself. Oh, I will not deny that when he first came I greatly liked him. Indeed, for a while I allowed myself to become a little attached to him. But that time is past, thank heaven. I hardly know how or why. Oh, Emma. Oh, dearest Emma, I must embrace oh, you. Please, please, you must not exert yourself. <laughs> Mr. Weston will be so relieved. You see, it was, it was our dearest wish that you two would form an attachment. Then to receive this news this morning, imagine our feelings. Yes, I have escaped. But that does not acquit him, Mrs. Weston. No, no, indeed it does not. What right had he to come among us women with... Affections already engaged and, and manners so very disengaged. You have every right to feel as you do, Emma. Nevertheless, I, I still feel that for you he had a very special regard. That much, I am sure, was genuine. Yes, his behaviour toward me was certainly very marked. But how could Jane have borne it so calmly to stand by while repeated attentions are made to another woman before one's face? Well, that shows a degree of detachment I can neither understand nor respect. I think perhaps she did resent it, Emma. And that is why her manner towards you has always been so cool. Perhaps. Then that I can understand. And I withdraw my imputation. But I am not thinking of myself. I am quite old enough and wise enough in the ways of the world to need no protection. Others are not. There are some more trusting than myself, less able to form cool judgments and, and therefore exposed to greater hurts. Thank you. Well, Miss Woodhouse, is it not the oddest news in the world? What news is that, Harriet? About Jane Fairfax and Mr. Churchill. Oh, did you ever hear anything so strange? Mr. Weston told me himself. He, he said it was still to be a great secret, but that you knew it already. Yes, Harriet, I did. Had you any idea of his being in love with her? But then I expect perhaps you had. 
You who can see into everybody's heart. I'm beginning to doubt I ever had such a talent, Harriet. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, if I had, you may be sure that rather than give you hope, I would have cautioned you accordingly. Me? Why caution me, Miss Woodhouse? Surely you do not think I care for Mr. Churchill? Oh, Harriet, I am delighted to hear you speak so. But you will not deny that you did give me reason at one time to believe that you cared for him. Oh, no, Miss Woodhouse, never. Oh, really, how could you so mistake me, I wonder? Well, I know we agreed never to name names, but considering how infinitely superior he is to everybody else, I would not have thought it possible that I could mean any other person. Really, Miss Woodhouse, I, I should hope I had better taste than to think of Mr. Frank Churchill. Well, Harriet, if the object of your attachment is not Mr. Churchill, then who? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, how can you ask such a thing? Oh, you who know me so well and have been always acquainted with the gentleman. Harriet, let us now be quite clear upon this beyond any shadow of a doubt. Are you now speaking of Mr. Knightley? But of course, Miss Woodhouse. Who else? I thought when we talked of him, it was as clear as possible. When we talked, Harriet, it was of Mr. Churchill's kindness in rescuing you from the gypsies. Oh, no, Miss Woodhouse. I, I was meaning that time at the ball when Mr. Elton refused to dance with me and Mr. Knightley rescued me from my wretchedness. I see. Well, let us suppose, then, that you have this particular affection for Mr. Knightley. Have you any reason to suppose it is returned? Yes. I must say that I have. Oh, what, pray? Well, it, it was the other day at Donwell when he so particularly sought me out to show me round the garden. Oh, but perhaps you did not notice, Miss Woodhouse. I remember him speaking to you for a moment, certainly. Oh, it was more than a moment. Much, much more. He led me by the arm to the extreme end of the path beyond the orchard, especially to show me a view of the farm he rents to Mr. Martin. He must have remembered that I used to stay there long ago when I was a girl. Oh, he was most particular in his kindness and attention to me, Miss Woodhouse. Well, I will only say, Harriet, that I know Mr. Knightley to be the last man in the world who would wittingly lead a woman to believe he cares for her more than he really does. Yes, that is true. He is altogether too fine a man, is he not, Miss Woodhouse? Oh, dear Miss Woodhouse, it is to you I owe all this happiness. To me? Oh, yes, do you not see that if you had not brought me out so, uh, I would never have dared even to speak to him. Oh, dear, dear Miss Woodhouse, I shall never be able to repay you as long as I live. Oh, there, I must go. I quite forgot. I promised Mrs. Goddard I would be home some half hour ago. Oh, my mind has quite gone to pieces these days, I'm afraid. Mr. Knightley. Does it still rain? Yes, it still rains. Poor Mrs. Weston, who most concerns me in such weather as this. I said it's poor Mrs. Weston I'm thinking about. Oh, yes, Father. Which will be a relief when this sorry business is over and done with. Poor Miss Bates. She'll miss her niece more than she imagined. I wish Mr. Knightley would come back from London. It seems so strange without his visits. Where is Williams? It must be almost time for my morning gruel. Rain is easing off a little. It's a sad thing when one lives, as it were, from one cup of gruel to the next.
Emma, you're not thinking of going out. Yes, Father. But my child, my child. Oh, dear. I was told you were in the garden. It's tonight, dear. I had no notion you had to come back from London. When did you return? This morning before breakfast. Oh, then you had a wet journey, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, I did. Very unpleasant. And your father, he's well despite that dreadful weather? Perfectly, thank you. He really does not mind being obliged to remain indoors. It is I who suffer, in temper at least. Whom were you about to visit, Harriet? Harriet? Oh, no, no. I was not visiting. I was merely taking the air a little, that is all. May I join you? Please do. Shall we take shelter? By all means. Well, Mr. Knightley, have you heard the news? Uh, what kind of news? Not unpleasant, I hope. Oh, no. Pleasant. Very pleasant. There is to be a wedding. And what could be more pleasant than that? You mean Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill? But who told you? Only I and one or two others know of it. I had a note from Weston on parish matters. He mentioned it. Oh, Mr. Weston. So you see, like most secrets, it's well known to all. I am sure you are less surprised than any of us, Mr. Knightley. I remember once you cautioned me. I do wish I had attended to it. But I seem to have been doomed to blindness upon a great many matters. Poor Emma. Do not take it too much to heart. I, I do not, I, I assure you. What right have I to do so, Mr. Knightley? Time. None whatever. Some time, dearest Emma. Time will heal the wound. Yes. Yes, of course. You're an excellent good sense. And the need your father has of you, this surely must be some comfort to you. Oh, yes, they are. Most certainly. Oh, abominable fellow. Scoundrel. Poor Jane deserves better, in my opinion. Jane. Much, much better. Oh, it's a sorry business for all concerned, if you ask me. Oh, Mr. Knightley, you are quite mistaken. Hmm? I can assure you I need no sympathy where that match is concerned. Emma, is this really true? Oh, yes. I can swear it from my heart. <gasps> then whom did you think I meant? I, I was not sure that... That is, I, I think I somewhat mistook your meaning. I thought perhaps you referred to... Hmm? But no matter. My blindness, where Mr. Frank Churchill was concerned, led me to act very foolishly. I see that now. The fault was mainly his. I'm sure you had very little with which to reproach yourself. Oh, I can assure you that is not so. I have very little to say in my own defense. I was tempted, 
by his attentions, my vanity was flattered. I see now that I was merely a blind to conceal his sure feelings for her, and I was taken in with all the rest. The man is a villain, utterly beneath contempt. Except that somewhere inside, I think perhaps I was not quite taken in. Something, I, I know not what, has kept me safe from him. Oh, well, perhaps there may be some hope for him yet. She may save him. I do know your high opinion of her. Oh, indeed, he is a favourite of fortune. He meets with a young woman on holiday, he gains her affection, but his aunt is in the way. Then his aunt dies. He has used everybody ill, and they're all delighted to forgive him. <laughs> now, he's indeed a fortunate young man to draw such a prize, because no man, in my opinion, whoever he may be, can fail to benefit from the company of a good-hearted, honest woman. You speak as though you envied him, Mr. Knight. <laughs> yes. Yes, in this one respect at least, I do envy him. And never more so than at this moment. <sighs> you do not ask me why, I notice. You are determined to have no curiosity, it seems. Oh, that is not but the you're, reason. You're wise, no doubt. Very wise, very wise. But I, I can be wise no longer. Emma, I must tell you what you will not ask, even though I may wish it unsaid the next moment. Please do not say it, Mr Knightley. Please, please do not say it. Very well. As you wish. Perhaps we should go in. Your father must wonder what has become of you. Please forgive me, Mr. Knightley. It is just that I could not bear for anything to spoil our long and happy friendship. So tell me what you wish, and I will hear it and try to give my true opinion as a friend. As a friend? Oh, oh my dear Emma, I have no wish. Well, Never mind, never mind. So be it. I... I accept your offer, strange as it may seem. As a friend, then? Hmm? Well, tell me, have I no chance of ever succeeding? Mr. Knightley, I think... Oh, my dearest Emma, chance. whatever the outcome of this conversation, my dearest, most beloved, Tell me at once. I mean, say no, if it must be said. Oh, you know I cannot make speeches, Emma. If I loved you less, I could talk about it more, but you know what I am. And I've blamed you and lectured you, and you've borne it all more than any other woman in England would have done. Oh, God knows I've been a very indifferent lover. I do understand me, I know you do. And at this moment, all I want is to hear your voice. And tell Cook to keep a pan of boiling water on the fire in case she's met with an accident. Yes, sir. Oh, and send one of the boys round to Dr. Perry. Tell him to come at once. At once, mind. Yes, sir. Oh, why ever did I consent to her going? It was the wildest folly, sheer madness. I shall blame myself for the rest of my life. To think that it has taken me so long to recognise what was there before my eyes all this time. And I, who thought myself so expert upon these matters, could not even see into the workings of my own heart. <laughs> oh, we are a sorry pair of fools, you and I. But we need not admit as much to anyone but each other. I have only one worry in all this, and that is my father. Oh, yes, your father, he does pose something of a problem. But I think for the moment we should keep silent, do not you? Yes, I fear so. Until perhaps some favourable opportunity presents itself. Are you quite sure you're not cold, my love? Father, I keep telling you I have never felt better in the whole of my life. There is that not 
not enough to reassure you. Well, of course, had I known you were with Mr. Knightley, I should not have been so concerned. You must forgive me, Mr. Knightley, but I'm sure you realise that this child is my most cherished possession. I fear I'm a very tiresome, sad old invalid these days. Poor Emma is the sufferer. Oh, but it's a great comfort in one's latter years to have such selfless devotion. A great comfort. I hope, my love, that you will be suitably rewarded. Thank you, Father. And now, my dear, I know Mr. Knightley will forgive a fond father's concern, but I think you should rest. Rest, Father? But why? Yes, yes, you had a strenuous day. You are good enough to look after me. I shall do the same for you. Mr. Knightley will understand, I'm sure. Excuse me, sir, but Dr. Perry has arrived. Do oh, uh, yes, sir. Dr. Perry? Why should he call? I did not send for him. Father! One cannot be too careful, my dear. Look, uh, I will go and have a quiet word with him. Poor father. We cannot tell him just now. No. And with Mrs. Weston's news so imminent, two such changes in his settled order of things would indeed be cruel, I admit. But he must be told eventually. And it should be my concern to do so. No. No, it must come from me. I could not have it otherwise. Very well, if you really wish it. Give me time to prepare his mind gradually. Give me time, Mr. Knightley. Certainly. But on one condition. What is that? That you cease to call me Mr. Knightley. Oh, but that is how I always think of you. I do have another name, you know. Oh, yes, but to call you by it would make you seem other than you are, and that I should not like. Oh, dear. I do remember once when I was quite a girl calling you George, just to see if it would annoy you. <laughs> and when I found it did not, I never did so again. Can you not do so now, just to please me? George. George. Mm. George. Oh, I am sorry, Mr. Knightley. It is quite impossible. I cannot do it. You will have to remain as you are. Dear Harriet, I am somewhat troubled that we have not seen you at Hartfield just recently. The fault, I know, is mine. But the truth is that I have had much to occupy my thoughts. Dear Harriet, I think we should meet before long because there is something of particular importance concerning us both and another that I feel you should know. Dear Miss Woodhouse, thank you so much for your kind letter. I too am concerned that we have not met recently, but as you know, I'm to go to London. Fancy London to stay a few days with your sister and Mr. John Knightley to look after the little boys. I'm so excited I can scarcely write. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, do tell me, will my blue cambric do for mornings, do you think? Or should I get something a little finer? Do please be quite honest with me, Miss Woodhouse, and tell me what you truly think. Dear Harriet. You sly thing, Jane. Is she not a sly thing, eh, Miss Bates? To have kept such a secret from us all these months, hmm? I'm sorry you should feel this way, Mrs. Elton, but I'm afraid under the circumstances it was unavoidable. Oh, it was not her choice, Mrs. Elton. Truly it was not, was it, Jane, dear? <laughs> Besides, you were not the only one to be kept in ignorance. When she told me, all I could say was, Jane. Mm. <laughs> that is exactly what I said, is it not, Jane, dear? Jane! I said. Mm. No, I was merely joking, Miss Bates. <laughs> I hope I'm not one to take offence over such a matter. <laughs> Though I do hear that a certain young lady is most put out to learn that Mr. Churchill's affections are otherwise engaged. Oh, and who is that, Miss Elton? Oh, I mention no names, Jane, my dear. Uh, but I'm told that poor old Mr. Woodhouse's life is made quite miserable as a consequence. Oh, do I hear a visitor? Perhaps it is my carosposa. I asked him to call for me here. <laughs> Miss Woodhouse. Miss Bates. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I was not aware. Good morning, Miss Woodhouse. I had called especially to speak with Miss Fairfax. I will come again another time. Oh, but Miss Woodhouse, we have not seen you for so long. I was only saying 
so to Jane this morning. Jane dear, Miss Woodhouse. I'm so pleased to see you. Do Please. sit down, Miss Woodhouse. Now a little drink of something. Do you not think, Miss Woodhouse, that our saucy little friend here is looking prettier than ever? It is quite wonderful the change that Perry has brought about, is not it? At least uh, we must suppose it to be Perry. Hmm? Miss Fairfax certainly looks extremely well. Yes, does she not? Well, this is quite a little party. A few of Patty's biscuits. <laughs> ah, now that must be my lord and master. He's been with Knightley on some parish business at the Crown. So tiresome. Oh, but the meeting at the Crown is tomorrow, I think, Mrs. Elton. I think you're mistaken, Miss Woodhouse. Yes, his opinion is always being sought upon this and that. They seem not to be able to do anything without Mr. E. Ah. Mr. Elton. Oh, Mr. Elton, do come in. Oh, but you do look hot. Such a warm Yes, day. I am extremely hot, madam. I have been all over to Donwell in this... Boiling sun, oh, to no purpose. Let me get you a little glass of sun. Well, my love, but the meeting was to be at the Crown, surely. No, no, that is tomorrow. Tomorrow, dear, are you sure? Yes, perfectly. Oh, oh. You say Mr. Knightley asked you to call at Donwell and then was not there? But how very strange, very unlike him, very so considerate always. But then I have noticed that his manner is a little strange lately, a little forgetful and preoccupied. Would you not say so, Miss Woodhouse? Oh, I had not noticed, Miss Bates. If you will forgive me, I think I really must be leaving. Oh, As please do not come run with you away. to the door. Must you really, not? my love, I cannot imagine how Knightley could behave like this to you of all people. He becomes more eccentric every day. Yes. Miss Fairfax, I had hoped to have the opportunity to say how very, very delighted I am for you and to wish you every happiness. Thank you. I, too, had hoped for an opportunity to speak. I'm afraid you must have felt my manner towards you cold and artificial. But I had always a part to act, which was very foreign to me, I do assure you. You are much too scrupulous. It is I who should apologize. In fact, I blush to recall my behavior on several occasions. Oh, but you need not, really, you need not on my account. I was fully aware of the true situation, remember. You are very generous and understanding. Well, goodbye, Jane. I may call you that, I hope. Please do. Is it not sad that we should only truly become friends now that you are leaving us? I begged her to take the carriage. James is very good. He's quite agreeable to harnessing the horses if one gives him plenty of notice. Oh, Emma, my child. Father, I had thought to already find you gone for your walk. I'm afraid he was detained. Yes, well, uh, well, I'll be off. Uh, don't run away, Mr. Knightley. Stay and talk to her for a little if you have nothing more pressing to do. Thank you, I will. Oh, uh, no news of poor Miss Taylor. Mrs. Weston, Papa? No, I heard none. James has it from someone at the Crown that the midwife was seen going in that direction last night. Gossip has had the baby born ten times this week already. It is usually the same on these occasions, is it not? Poor Miss Taylor. It is a sorry business. Poor Weston, too, come to that. Poor father. We must tell him. Not to do so puts us on exactly a level with Frank Churchill. Yes, I quite agree. But for the moment, Emma, I have some other news for you. News which you may not find agreeable. Oh, but you apparently do. You are trying not to smile. What is it? You may not smile when you hear it, Emma. Well, why not? I'm sure what pleases you will please me. But there is one subject, and I hope only one, on which we do not think alike. Emma, prepare yourself for the worst. Harriet Smith is, after all, to marry Robert Martin. No. It is so indeed. I have it from the young man's own lips this morning. As he is a tenant of mine, he did me the honor to come first to me with the news. Um, you like it, my Emma, as little as I fear. I wish I got opinions could be the same. Mr. Knight, do you quite mistake me? It is just that for a moment my breath is completely taken away. Oh, dear, 
admirable, Harriet. She is quite incorrigible. But tell me all the details. How, where and when. Do not spare me any of it, I beg you. Better than that. She shall tell you herself. She longs to see you, Emma, but fears that she might now be unwelcome. Harriet? Hmm? Oh, never. Never. the state of my silly heart better than I knew it myself. Oh, I can assure you I did not, Harriet. This notion of me is quite undeserved. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I'm so happy. I truly believe Robert and I were made for each other. I've always felt it, as you know, from the very first moment that we met. There were moments, I know, when I felt a, a certain passing interest in others, but those were just the idle fancies of a foolish girl. I, I have forgot them already. Miss Woodhouse, would you see him? Would you speak with him? Well, of course I will, Harriet. Why should I not? If he will speak to me. Yes. Will you be coming up? Harriet, you have not left him standing in the hall. Miss Woodhouse, this is Mr. Martin. I must apologize for this uncivil treatment, Mr. Martin. Do sit down. Oh, I can stay about a moment, ma'am. I have to see Mr. Knightley about the farmhouse. Miss Woodhouse, I must thank you for your great kindness to Harriet. Indeed, she speaks of little else. I deserve few thanks from you, Mr. Martin. But make her a good husband, and you will always be my friend. I'll do my best, ma'am. I am sure you will. Well, if you'll forgive me, I hope you won't think me rude, but I do not wish to keep Mr. Knightley waiting. That you are sensible of your obligations to Mr. Knightley is the very best recommendation you could have in my eyes, Mr. Martin. Harriet must bring you again when you have more time. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, is he not the most splendid man you've ever seen? He seems a very excellent young man, certainly. So poor little Harriet Smith is to marry. Oh dear, oh dear. So young, so, so delicate. Was there nothing you could say to dissuade her? No, father, nothing. One would have thought that the sad example of poor Miss Taylor would have proved sufficient. But why, father? The confinement was remarkably easy and the baby is thriving. That is not what I wish to discuss. Father, there is something that I feel it would be unfair to withhold from you any longer. Harriet is not the only one who is contemplating marriage. What? Well, who else? What do you mean, child? You cannot mean that my dear old friend, Miss Bates... No, Father, not Miss Bates. But what is this, I wonder? It's some kind of madness. Father, Mr. Knightley has done me the very great honour of asking me to become his wife. What? No, you cannot mean it. And I have accepted him. No. No, no. No, it cannot be. It cannot be. Oh, no, Father, please do not distress yourself so. I shall not be leaving you. You know that. I could never leave you. What do you mean, leaving how so? Well, we have talked it all over at very great length. And the suggestion is that John Knightley and Isabella should come down to Donwell. And that with your approval, Mr. Knightley and I should remain here. So you will be gaining two daughters instead of one. And more of Mr. Knightley's company for good measure. Oh, there, Father, can you not see what a happy arrangement it would be for all of us? I do not care for arrangements. I am too old for such things. But, Father, No! I... No, it cannot be. There is something of even greater importance. What is that, my dear? 
I hear that Mr. Weston's poultry house has been broken into again last night. No, is that a fact? And all the turkeys taken. Really? This is the third occasion in the last few weeks. Oh, dear, oh dear, what times we do live in. Nothing is sacred, nothing is safe. But if Mr. Knightley were here all the time, well, he would always know what to do, Papa. Yes, yes, that is very true. Oh, very well then, my dear. You give us your consent, Father? Well, yes, yeah, yes. You will not regret it, I know. You always enjoy Mr. Knightley's company, so do you not? Well, yes, yes, of course I do. You know that I do. Well, now you will have even more of it, for we shall see him daily. But we already see him daily, so what is the object of this marriage? Oh, Emma, Emma, why could we not just go on as we were? So, Knightley is to move into Hartfield. Well, let us hope the young lady's pride will be contented at last. Rather him than me, that's what I can say. It's always a shocking plan, living together with one's parents. There was a couple once tried it near Maple Grove, I remember. And they were separated within the year. Mm. Oh, I hope it may prove a very happy arrangement. Very happy indeed. Anyway, I'm sure I wish them well with all my heart. Do not you, Jane, dear? Of course, she's not here. Oh, oh is she not a beautiful girl, eh? Is she not a fine, handsome girl? Oh, indeed, she is, Mr. Weston. She has beautiful eyes. She has quite the look of her father. Oh, she's a fine girl. She's a beautiful girl, is she not? Eh? Hey, hey. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, Jane, may I offer you my heartiest good wishes for your future? Thank you, Mr. Knightley, and may I do the same to you, although I'm sure it is quite unnecessary. Thank you, my love. Here's your aunt, Jane. Take note of her well. I have to thank you, Miss Woodhouse, for a very kind, forgiving message in one of Mrs. Weston's letters. I hope you do not retract what you then said. No, Mr. Churchill, not in the least. And I am very pleased to have this opportunity of telling you so to your face. Oh, you're much kinder than I deserve. What an impudent dog I was. But I could not break my vow and tell you the true situation. Though there was one moment when I was sorely tempted to. Yeah, Emma, my dear. Mr. Mr. Churchill. Mr. But I comfort myself with the belief that you were well aware that it was all, in a way, a, a form of sport. Because you, too, indulge in it a little yourself, I think. I have a suspicion, Mr. Churchill, that in the midst of everything, you had a secret satisfaction in tricking us all. No, Miss Woodhouse, how could you suspect me of such a thing? I was the most miserable wretch. Oh, no, Mr. Churchill. I think I speak with some authority, because I, too, would have enjoyed doing so myself. <laughs> and I think there is a little likeness between us in many respects. Do not you? So you really have forgiven me, I think. Then I am content. But I knew you would. <laughs> if you will forgive this interruption, it appears we have acquired the wrong partners. <laughs> well, friends, dear, dear friends, since we are thus gathered together, it falls upon me to perform the melancholy duty of wishing these couples long life and prosperity. Uh, so if you would be good enough to raise your glasses. Our Hartfield claret is a good wine, I think, not too acid and will hurt nobody. No, no, not you, Miss Taylor, not while you are. Emma, my dear, a glass of milk for poor Miss Taylor, if you please. Father! 